Are we on the air? We are. Come all you lads and lassies now, come all you from afar. This is the story of a pub called Gleason's White House Bar. Down by the lordly Shannon is Limerick's brightest star. Gleason's White House Bar. Gleason's White House Bar. Gleason's White House Bar. You'll always find the welcome here, so stop and have a jar. At Gleason's White House Bar. Gleason's White House Bar. We'll sing a song or read a poem or we'll strum an old guitar. At Gleason's White House Bar. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please, thank you very much indeed. It is my privilege on this, the 164th consecutive week of poetry here in the White House in Limerick City in Ireland, to welcome every one of you, one of you on behalf of Glenn McLaughlin and the White House Poetry Revival team. And I think that deserves a small little bit of a bull of us for starters, 164. Come on, give it a bit. Thank you. I have a special job to do. Kali Spira, that's for the Greek visitors. Dober Vertia, that's for the Slovenian visitors. Guten Abend for the German mind. Deutsche ist nicht gut, du bist deine, du schöne Blume. Bona sera, bona sera, will I sing it for you? Bona sera, bona sera, senorita. It is nice to be in Napoli, etc., etc. Uh, the other one is, is Golden Afton from Denmark. Please, you're very, very welcome to Ireland and Limerick City. And bonus notches for Spain. Is that okay, girls? The best I can do. Ach, 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 no, you, you clap too quick because Tawn Gaelga Gohanna Wahaga, Marcus, you are in Ireland now and I'm going to speak Gaelic to you. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, we come to. We come to a joyous moment, I describe it just as that of the evening. Without any further ado, with any further weapon and Barney Sheen's part, I say to every one of you, welcome. And welcome to Desmond O'Grady. Give him a boot of us, ladies and gentlemen, please. Thank you so much for this. Well, I want to thank Barney Sheehan for his invitation to come to read in the White House and to thank um, everybody in the White House for being present and, uh, and for giving us the hospitality. And I'd like to say in passing, that the first time I read my poems in the White House was in April 1954, which kind of uh, reminds me that uh, I'm still growing up. Uh, and so um, I, I have selected these poems, so I've read many times since in the White House, but so as not to repeat myself, I've selected the poems to go along with a basic situation. Place and person, or persona, if you like. And sometimes male, sometimes female persona. And I will read straight through so as not to delay you from getting to uh, the three Hail Marys at the end uh, uh, at, 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 at the bar. So we begin uh, in Limerick. I'm going to go through city by city. This is called, very simply, A Song of Limerick Town. And it's dedicated to a friend of ours then. We then were friends, Dickie Harris, the, who became the Astor fellow, uh, Jack Donovan, the painter, and our friend Annette Reeves, who was well, one of us also. A Song of Limerick Town. We, in the fish-blue hours of clock strike, early morning, sleep in the house-huddled doors of our eyes, Love in our yawning Stole through the sailorless streets Of the still cot-cuddling town Where a sea-bedded fishing fleet Sleeps fast in the arms of Down anchors all hands ashore And now here with the bulk of our talk From the hours before Here with the sulking hulks of ships when no bells fore or aft will hang in the ears of morning and the town clock hoarsely churns its gears we are made one 
I with the men of the Limerick town, and you with the Shannon stream, made one till all doing is done. We're going to now perform the White House Christmas Poetry Grand Slam. It'll take about 15 or 25 minutes, and I know you'll enjoy our doing it. Before we do that, I'd ask this very lovely lady alongside me, Laurie Cross. Thank you very much indeed. Laurie will open the evening with a lovely, give her a big bull of us. And she will, she will play the mouth organ for you, and she'll play Limerick, you're a lady. So all those fine men that are out there, we look forward to you responding. Laurie, please. Waiting in the arms of distant waters, a new defined fire from home. And the one true love that I have ever known. Come on, lads. Could we have Robin of Canada, please? Thank you very much indeed. Well, it's good to see Laurie here again, after so many evenings away. And so I can finally read my poem for you. This is called Laurie Cross. I have three notebooks, so I never know the right one. Do you have a skill for dancing? I won an award for the waltz. I've been on my own now for 20 years, living out in the country. I have my man to drive me. He brings cigarettes from Spain. Do you smoke? And I have read on the BBC, and I have read on RTE, and I have read at the White House. I have three notebooks and away with a harmonica. I would ask you to give a warm welcome once again to Barry Ryan. Um, I have just one poem tonight to read. It's, um, I, I've been my girlfriend is from Serbia and for the last number of months I've been watching her master the English language and I've always found that just looking at her learn the language has, um, has drawn comparisons about how somebody writes a poem and um, when you're looking for a metaphor and a word and how annoying and frustrating it can be but that the actual process is the learning process um, it's called In Rain it's been raining for days. Everything is drenched. We take turns by the window, comforted by the poverty of trees and passers-by limp as leaves. Fingering the glass, you turn and ask about soup you can see through. What the proper word for is. You can taste it, you say. It's on the tip of your tongue. You reach for cigarettes and cold coffee on the windowsill. You know, you know, it flows, is fluid, pours, very thin. Your mother makes it when you're ill. You know and bite your lip. It's full of bits, of peppers and beans, swimming in a bowl. 
On days like this, it insulates, makes complete. You know the word. It describes the world in heavy rain, when everything seems to float. The street outside is like that today. Is there no world in Ireland for soup that's consomme? Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honour, and I'd ask every one of you to give him a big, warm, bula boss welcome from the United States, please, Buddy Wakefield. Thank you very much indeed. This poem was written on a 2,000-mile road trip from Minneapolis to Seattle with, uh, after my car was broken into it, so it's the result of 2,000 miles with, with no radio. We both know the smell of a convenience store at 4 a.m. like the backs of a lot of hands. She sells me trucker crack, mini thins. It's like vibrant. She doesn't make me feel awkward about it. She can tell it's been a long drive and it's only going to get longer. Offers me a free cup of coffee, but I never touch the stuff. Besides, I'm going to need more speed than that. We notice each other's smiles immediately. It's our favorite thing for people to notice, our smiles. It's all either one of us has to offer. You can see it in the way our cheeks stretch out like arms, wanting nothing more than to say you all are welcome here. She shows brittle nicotine teeth with spaces between each one. Her fingers are bony, there's no rings on them, and she'd love to get her nails done someday. One time, she had her hair fixed. They took out the grease, made it real big on top, and feathered it. Okay, she likes it like that. She'll never be fully informed on some things, just like I will never understand who really buys moon pies or those rolling, wrinkled, dried-up sausages. But then again, she's been here a lot longer than me. She's seen everything from men who grow dreadlocks out of their top lips to children who look like cigarettes. I give her my money, I wait for my change, but I feel like there's something more happening here, y'all. I feel like a warm mop bucket and dingy tiles that'll never come clean. I feel like these freezers cannot be restocked often enough. I feel like trash cans of candy wrappers with soda pop dripping down the wrong side of the plastic. I feel like everything just got computerized. I feel like she was raised to say a lot of stupid things about a color. And I feel like if I were to identify myself as gay, this conversation would stop. It's what I do. I feel, I get scared sometimes, and I drive, but in one minute and 48 seconds, I'm going to walk out of here with a full tank of gas, a bottle of mini thins, and a pint of milk while there's a woman still trapped behind a Mike encounter somewhere in North Dakota who says she wants nothing more than to hear my whole story, all 92,775 miles of it. I can feel it though, y'all. She's heard more opinions and trucker small talk than Santa Claus has made kids happy. So I only find the nerve to tell her the good parts. She's the kindest thing to happen since Burlington, Vermont. I don't want to leave it at that because men who are not smart have taken it farther, have cradled her up like a nut cracker and made her feel as warm as a high school education on the dusty back road or a beer in a koozie. I feel like she's been waiting here a long time for the one who'll come two stepping through that door on 18 wheels without making her feel like it's her job to sweep up the nutshells alone when she's done been cracked again. Who won't tempt her to suck the wedding ring off his dick but will show her simply love. She doesn't need me or any other man but she doesn't know that either and I'm just hoping like crazy she doesn't think I'm the one because the only time I'll ever see North Dakota again is in a Van Morrison song late, late at night, I promise y'all I feel like she's 37 years old wearing 51, badly dying inside like certain kinds of dances around fires to speak through you a forest if y'all weren't so taken with sparks but she was never given those words, she has not been told she can definitely change the world, she knows some folks do but not in convenience stores and not with lottery tickets so I finally ask her what I've been feeling the entire time I've been standing there still getting scared like I do sometimes, really really ready to drive, I ask is this it for you? Is this all you'll ever do? Her smile collapsed. That tightly strapped in pasty skin and went loose. Her heart felt crooked, she said, not knowing my real name. I can tell, buddy, by the many thins and the way you drive. We're both taken by novelty. We've both believed in mean gods. We both spend our money on things that break too easily, like people. And I can tell you think you've had it rough, so especially you should know it's what I do. I dream. I get high sometimes. And I'm going to roll out of here one day. I just might not get to drive. Thank you.
Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would ask you to give a very warm welcome to Arto Canela. Are you there, Art, please? Thank you very much indeed. Lovely. And I call this Segovia. You walk in our midst, 12 years and four twenties of steps in your walk, age etched on your countenance. You take your seat on the stage, welcoming to your open arms the instrument of your soul in all its varied moods of shade and light, of joy and sadness. Your foot resting on your support, you create from lifeless strings the slow classical airs from Albanith to Tarega. I hear the nightingale <clears throat> divinely pitch its song over timeless Granada on this night of nights. Your aged fingers, ever illuminating, Fresco Baldi, Villa Lobos, and above all, your godly master, Bach. I leave the auditorium in my ears murmuring streams rush by the stately trees of El Bosque. We are privileged, ladies and gentlemen, to have Gabriel Fitzmaurice in our White House. Gabriel, please, thank you. First of all, like I said already, it's, it's just great to be in the White House, I mean, the home of poetry in America. I'd like to start out with a kind of a, a light-hearted poem. So this is the white shirt, and I suppose it's a poem about, I won't say growing old, but maturing. I bought a white shirt in John's menswear today, a sign that my youth is passing away, a colour I once was unwilling to wear when I had no belly and twice as much hair. My reds and my yellows now blend into white, my white shirt reflects all the colours of light, as I broaden my spectrum with each passing day, my teeth getting longer, my hair turning grey. Laughing at wisdom, youth boasts it's no more than energy at ebbing. At full flow before, my colours reflected but aspects of white, what vision I had, dividing the light. I'm free from the passions of uncertain youth. I'm here at John Sexton's to buy me a suit. I'll dress as I am with a collar and tie, and welcome the man. Farewell to the boy. Farewell to the boy, and welcome my prime, when my life and my love come together in rhyme and all the old conflicts and all the old hurt surrender themselves in the sign of this shirt. Thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a warm welcome to our poet, McGregor O'Brien, who has joined us in the past two or three months, and we've had the pleasure of his company pretty well every Wednesday night. Please, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Good evening. I'm going to continue with the same cheery theme that Dominic started with, death. The first uh, poem is called, What Happens to the Dead? The dead really do not leave. They wander the minds of the living until slowly they lose their faces, they get small and slowly disappear. There are some, however, those who were always alone, who disappear immediately. They do not leave, they disappear. And then there were those who were never really here. Thank you. Two other short ones on the same theme. Second, Irish cemeteries. I love Irish cemeteries. They're old and they're complex. There is order and there is chaos. There is beauty and also bad taste. There is simplicity and opulence. They are so very contradictory as life is to death. Irish cemeteries are as enigmatic as the Irish always are, living or dead. I do understand cemeteries, however, for beyond the oxymorons and the contradictions, I know the secret that guided everything there. In cemeteries, you see, 
everyone is dead. Ladies and gentlemen, our next poet is one of our own locals. Tom McCarthy, please, would you join us up here at the bar? Standard is very high here tonight. I'm frightened to read something. So Berta shouts, go on, Tom. So I'll read Berta. It's her most recent poem. And I suppose it's, it's paying tribute to her, actually. Berta. But she's not even blushing. <laughs> <laughs> Tentatively vibrant, exuberant in expression, behind her the thoughts of a smile, textured by the shadows of a soft hat. Fashionable in the surroundings, like the colors violet and blue, complementing each other as one. In conversation she excels. In the background she dwells patiently with a word clearly spoken whispering gently the point of a matter of fact like the sunset falling upon the sand creating a misty glow of orange with a crimson red holding her point of view she begs to differ a lady you might say who gives way to the promise of a rainbow changing a grey clouded sky to a light blue allowing the sun to shine through The curse of the blight. I turned the earth right, but the curse of the blight condemned me and my family to death. Without conscience or care, it spread through the air and killed every potato I set. A fungus in breed, it blackened the seed, like the landlords it took from the land. Without crops, empty pots, hunger set in. It left nothing for the baskets in hand. With each stalk that I turned, I faltered and churned, I trembled with hunger and fear. And each blackened leaf brought nothing but grief, it meant death for many that year. As dysentery came, I begged without shame, for my woman and young ones I tried. I scraped and I scrounged, I cursed at the ground, but deep in my soul I had died. The graveyards were full with the old and the young, and the crops had failed once again. Many gave up on the side of the road both patience and bodies growing thin. With the stench of the crops from the stalks and the plots, the country was in disarray. As the soup boilers drained, many were named, and those that were left knelt to pray. At last I was there, without conscience or care, caught up in the tranquil of debt. Without family or home, I died all alone, with the curse of the blight on my breath. Bought by Caffrey Moses as a grocery wine store And then the sea words white and haze made it so much more T'was taken by the Gleason family before the war A Gleason's White House Bar A Gleason's White House Bar A Gleason's White House Bar You'll always find a welcome here so stop and have a jar A Gleason's White House Bar a Gleason's White House bar Or sing, sing a song or read a poem Or strum an old guitar A Gleason's White House bar Ladies and gentlemen, our first poet this evening Give a very warm welcome to one of the old stalwarts of the White House I shouldn't say old stalwarts One of the, one of the very distinct foundation stones of the White House Dominique Taylor, thank you very much indeed Thank you Thanks very much Barney Poem called Shan Owen before the Limnock, there was river. Water splashing, insects humming, birds singing, wind blowing through nameless islands and unbounded wet. It flowed, fleece-like, to the sea, unseen, unknown, only to itself. It reveled in the majesty of its domain, cradled the land in its arms and gave it life. As the wood rib boats slowly colonized the locks and islands of the Shan Owen, it gave up its bounty. To invader and native it gave equally, accepted the tribute of fools and wise men, hid the heart stricken in the secret places between the rushes and the shore, turned its waters into bitter tears. But always cleaning, receiving, renewing, rippling across the surface of this glimmering water, it remains river, old and new. Thank you very much. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, another warm welcome for Project Fund, Andrew Carpenter. Thank you very much indeed. I'll just fire away with this one. I have met with failure many times in my life. So much so, it seems to be my wife. But I choose not to be to it betrothed. To form that union, I am loath. I would rather marry a mind spellbound, as I by music, myth, and lore profound, that we may wander through the murky night, to the starry sky, and eternal light. I'm going to take the liberty of just reading you one short little one. A late evening at Kathleen Nights. This round red circle vision sits above the ridge between the smoky clouds of column turf that sends its hue of warmth through our public house. A settling sun of ages speaks out our life in stages. Bricks and mortar, sand and blocks, famine laboured long gone by. Easy nights and long days off. Solid stories, easy resting talk of wake and deal and kneel at mass. The sermon, well he said, he said. Harvest time restrained, liquid churns the inner heart, humour, chat and safe conclusion. Church and music of the street, the meeting place of rarity besides the River Meg. This round, round red circle vision sits above the ridge between the smoky clouds of turf, enclosed in black and white, speaking the music of a time gone by, liquid, churn the inner heart, gentleness and happiness. The day is done, the time has come, to sit together, talk whatever, beside the River Meg at Kathleen Nights. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Our next poet, please, is Bertha McCulloch, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the, the poem I'm going to read, the poem is called Waiting. And it's for Jean Ryan Hakizamana, Limerick, the 20th of October, 2004. As you wait, you paint beauty, precision, light of line. Still, in idyllian blue and green, white-lipped haze of high and hushed volcano, still as the silence which awaits the call. The call that's law, the call that's fate, the call that's place. And as late night later falls, while on your wall tall forests loom, black lush deep green shadows, aerial snakes Liana's loop and watch upon the floor grey and ghost-like figures scrape and scratch and flee. Then do you pray, do you pray that missionary's prayer who gave you name and faith and here a displaced place? Do you pray call, 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 call? And what Burundian thunders of hate and race, of fights and tribes, electrodes, brains, Rwandan pain, rumble through the pain and fear-filled forests of the mind, the mind that waits, that pains, that craves? And do you pray? Do you pray place, place? And do you cry? Do you cry call, 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 call? Give a very warm welcome, please, to Brian Slattery. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Janus. Janus was the god of beginnings and endings. This is called Janus. On a, pock, on a pockmarked beach of fine sand and pebble, the beach pony track still conveys the spirit of the body long gone. An incoming wave severs the track, isolating the spirit that calls me, and I respond. Four hooves I stand astride, and sense the quiver of its swishing mane, and the glance of its wild eye. Grabbing the reins, I turn its head into the herd of seahorses, galloping towards me, and I set its spirit free. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please, Austin Gilga. It's my privilege and always been our privilege. John O'Shea Coin has been with us, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who have come from overseas and don't understand with the Gaelic Irish, Schlieve Lucre Poet is now you have your opportunity. Give him a very warm welcome, please, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. John O'Shea Coin. Our president's young brother, his throat sliced ear to ear, crawled through streets to his parents' door. Trailing blood and fear, he lived unlike the others, the tens and dozens more. 
unremembered, forgotten, not spoken of any more. And southern commerce drinks the tills, and the chattering classes drink their wine, and dress for theatre and for gallery, and life for them is fine. Just like their people's people half a century before, that turned their backs on the tortured Magdalene's and Ireland's orphan poor and left us standing naked until the end of time indicted to the world for their appalling crime. And southern commerce clinked the tills and the chattering classes drank their wine and dressed for party and for gallery and dress for party and for gallery, and life for them was fine. From the forties to the famine, the Holocaust of T the Holocaust of T B took son and father and mother daughter, decimated family, and clergy said twas God's own will, and the free state hoarded each half crown, yet it ended in ten years by the courage of Noel Brown. While southern commerce rang the tills and the chattering classes drank their wine and dress for theatre and for gallery and life for them stayed fine. Here in Jim Kinney's city, a man who told the truth, there's silence everywhere, the silence of the mute, and nothing really changes. And, and nothing really changes, and nothing ever will. While some can sleep and others' misery, it all stays with us still. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to give a very warm welcome, please, to Terry Murray. Terry, thank you. Hi. Um, this is called uh, Tom O'Grady. It's about Tom, who's the brother of the poet Desmond O'Grady. Tom O'Grady. The pear tree watches our small banishings as we fumble for language, feeble shields to ward off the dreads of sound and night. I pour a libation of wine into the clitoris of the shield in a gig. You break a whiskey bottle against a standing stone. The dregs a tinder for the bonfires. Half Fomorian ourselves familiars of demons, knowing them to be just banished gods, ancestors of the ones who tempted Eve, hoarding the last of our shriveled children, the pear tree listens, while your backbone, a breastplated army, is pressed against my knee, as you read your brother's poem, The Old Ways. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege and an honour for me to welcome back to the White House, Kieran O'Driscoll. The first poem I'm going to, write, to read, um, I'm not going to write any tonight, but the first one I'm going to read is, it's a piece of advice, um, it's a poem in the form of advice to my son. You know, fathers give advice to their sons. Um, I don't know whether they still do it these days. I thought I was doing something completely new when I wrote this because um, and it's called Testament. I know it's a tall order, son, but this is my greatest wish for you, that you may learn to tell apart a false friend from a true and won't be wanting in recognition when you meet an honest heart. It seems like a huge imposition given the slippery times we're in. But it isn't a case of hair in spikes, or rouge applied to cheeks, or noses pierced or unpierced with rings, or a face without makeup. Drink from love's fountain, but don't dare think every fountain will pour a non polluted cup. Greed will be always there, it goes in various guises, spoiling identities, stripping them bare robbing us of the familiar. But no matter what complexion it prefers to mask itself in, bearded or beardless, lipsticked or not, 
whether it comes at you with or without plastic surgeon, surgery, liposuction, tux, no matter how good or bad it looks, deep down, greed sucks. Don't worry about wrong turnings, fumbles, missed opportunities or open goals. Those who are real with you will understand that a bird in the bush is often worth much more than two in the hand and dropped passes somehow seem to be part of the overall scheme. It's a bit of this it takes and a bit of that to be sound and not lose a screw. Sample the commodities on view. Don't glut yourself on any single one. Play the buffoon and then go home to the quietness of your room and be as much at ease in there as you are anywhere. The secret recipe is not to pin one's hopes on such and such a herb or spice. It's in how everything's combined. Remember the stillness behind all movement, the self you were given, the one I know but can't quite call by name, the nascent once for all and none other, the first and last, the never again that is you. Whatever else you do, don't drop that pass. Thanks very much. You were very warm. Welcome, please, to Tom Maloney. Thank you very much indeed, Tom. Thanks, Barney. Words for dogs. It isn't every day I can train words to reach a level of fitness before I go on to craft them, all muscled up and toned, sprung from my track record, handling intuition to that opportune when I am so into their meanings till finally, and maybe justifiably, I am able to stand back to what they have become, poems, no all G'd up, old, I'll be damned. Sometimes, in the interface between words and the imagination, I suffer from the usual injuries. Wits may propose that the worst kind is the metaphorical one to the wrist, that, ton, that torn ligament, writer's block. With writer's block, it's fair to say, all action stops, in the imagination, where people can be innocent, distracting, reassuring, even inspiring. Mick, for example, asked me if I was training any dogs these days. He added, after all, you had some good ones in the past. In reply, I didn't say anything to him about the writer's block, just that I was completely out of action. He sniffed the inspiration of the muse his eyes beaming that special light. Do you know, I can see you getting back into them. Thank you. On Tuesday nights, if you want to hear a different tune, there's Chris and Tom and Joe and Dom all howling at the moon. The guitars ring, the singers sing, and the bar on just goes boom. At least it's White House Bar. Gleason's White House Bar, the Gleason's White House Bar. You'll always find a welcome here, so stop and have a jar. A Gleason's White House Bar, a Gleason's White House Bar. Or oh, sing a song, or read a poem, or strum an old guitar. A Gleason's White House Bar. Ladies and gentlemen, I have nothing to add except to ask you to give this man a very, very warm welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, please. I invite you to listen to Chris Doro Flynn. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chris Doro. The Irish people always hated the, the informer, didn't they? Huh? Always hated the informer. And unfortunately, you had the supergrass in the north on both sides. Fellows who were involved in all the devilment, murdering people on both sides and blowing up pubs on both sides and so on. And yet, when the chance came, they took the money, betrayed their comrades in the, in the development on both sides and screwed it off and I wrote a poem called Supergrass he sells his comrades and his soul then runs to hide in some foreign hole and every day he lives he dies seeing his death in each man's eyes in every bite of food he'll taste the hatred of his native race his children too will curse his name when in God's time they learn their shame. 
And when he dies and goes to hell, they'll put him in a special cell where little devils as they pass can piss upon that super grass. Yeah. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from Charleville County Cork, please give a very warm welcome to Don Loughlin, please. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, my father is 92. I wrote this when he was 84. I called it 84 on his birthday. Old man is 84 today, still ranting and roaring into black Welsh nights. Scarce music in his house now, the children are all gone. Still holding court in the bridge by day and holding hands with the cold dish to lay it sleep, making sure no one understands the way he plays the game. Good stuff. Thank you. Our next poet, ladies and gentlemen, give a very warm welcome, please, to Noel Harrington. Thank you, Noel. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Barney. Apology to teenagers. I'm sorry for what you will become. Old, slow, judgmental and jealous. Regretful of what you didn't achieve, experiment with or venture out into. Or worse still, spiteful of those who did. You will put on weight. You'll lose hair, you'll count the money in your wallet, purse, bank account, pension fund, SSIA. You will be scared to stay up late lest you find it difficult to rise in the morning and get to work hindered by the headache of living. You will learn to despair of teenagers, their noise, their fashion, their antisocial behavior, and worst of all, their idealism. You will especially forget that teenagers view life differently to adults, and you will of course conclude that their view is not a valid one, while yours is the only one. You will laugh at their love affairs, condemn their sexuality, you will mock their music and judge their covers. You will denounce their actions, you will decry their apathy, you will suspect their integrity, you will moralize their morals. In short, you will become an adult. Could you give a very warm welcome please to Jean Barry from Cork. Cork is in the south of Ireland and Jean has driven all the way up to entertain us. Thank you very much indeed, Jean. Thanks, Barry. Uh, this is a poem I read here two weeks ago and I'd like to read it tonight for Tom McCarthy. If you're around there, Summer Tom. It's self-explanatory. It's, uh, my daughter, Laura. It's called Laura. When you left for Dublin... As the beautiful woman you are, I wasn't there. I wasn't there like the many times over these last seven years. I wanted to see your smile as you were leaving and donate a father's hug and kiss and to slip you a few bob. I knew it would have held me for that week. So I wrapped myself in guilt and instead I sent you love and wishes fit for a loyal queen. I visited your photographs more frequently and I played your voice over and over and over. Your exiled spirit I placed in each tidal volume and I treated myself to a peep. I searched for your hand at so many different heights. No grasp did I find. When the unfeeling world of work invited me back so soon after you were born I wore your love like a cloak. I couldn't stop smiling. I replayed the time when I left you in our house, when I went to pick your mother up at the shopping centre. Jesus, you weren't with us two weeks. I was riddled with guilt. Yet I knew it wasn't a punishable offence. I loved you more. I wore your whistle with the exuberance of the Marys on St. Patrick's Day, with the aura of a breastfeeding mother. I planted your waiting childhood garden. I weeded out the foes and torments, the buckling schoolyard punishers, and cleared the rocks of influential pagans. I sowed adventure and ambition, a meadow of encouragement. These days you are my panger born of 19 years, a harvest of genius and imagination, a bucket of love and understanding. I have bribed your guardian angel 
to saddle you a lifetime of safety. Thanks. Our next poet, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome, please, to George Sheehy. Thank you very much, George. Um, I haven't written a poem in 12 months, so I've written one. I'm delighted also because it's um, called Memories of Madrid, and it's actually dedicated to Edward and Dominic. Beer flowing as comfortable as conversation. We sitting in child as one beautiful woman after another passes by, igniting the night with our energy for life. The buildings are resting in the shadows, but hold enough shape to assure us they're awake. A carousel of cars and the conversation of their engines, the home of a language we hardly understand, and even a police siren add to the symphony of the city. And we three, learning that life isn't always how you live it or how it ends. Sometimes life is simply sipping beer with friends. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to John Lindy. Hi everybody. Fancy and Benny. When Benny Amino Gili alighted from Limerick Station, he met Fancy Renahem outside the railway hotel. Welcome he said. You brought the house down in Dublin last night and I was glad you met a friend from long ago, Madam Sheridan, Maggie from Mayo. Geely, surprised to hear this news vendor's rapport, inquired if we were coming to the concert that evening. I would if I had a ticket, replied Fancy. Everybody wants to hear Caruso's successor. And with that, Gili insisted he accept a complimentary the next morning, he came for the papers and Fonsi mentioned that his rendering of Poncielli's La Gioconda was superb and thanked him for the invitation. No, no, Gili protested. Thank you for allowing me to see Years later, Fonsi talked about postcards from Benny. But what did he mean by allowing him to see? I often asked and never got an answer. Perhaps it was, as Montaigne said, because it was him because it was me. Come on. Right, ladies and gentlemen, our guest, Fred Johnson. Thanks very much indeed, Bernie. Bird song. The small bird for the high branch and the sweetest song. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, John Johnson, please. John, you come up and give your poem before the interval. Thank you very much. Now, uh, folks, it's called Bean Everywhere Men. The moment had arrived at last, and Mother cried, Hooray! Get right down to the shop at once. It's bean time day today. Now, we'd never seen those beans before that came in a big tin, but longed to taste them all so much, it seemed like a great sin. The tin arrived, but problem then. No instructions on the label know how to cook or how to open as it sat there on the table. Let's put it in a pot, said Dad, with water or the heat, and soon I'm chomping we will be as those red beans we eat. The tin it was all swollen then, as Dad he used the tongs and placed it on the table so, watched by the family throng. 
But now their problem reared its head. How do we get them out? Then Dad, the brains, produced his knife. To spurring words we shout. He held a knife against a tin and hammered fiercely home. Then a mighty hiss exploded as the content shouldered home. Everywhere they stuck that day, on ceiling, kitchen wall, but we, with most agape each one, were covered most of all. The father gave a curse or two, but mother gave a laugh. Let's tell no one about this now. They'll think we're awfully daft. We never will forget that day and that experience we'd been through, for that exploding tin will live forever and the day the big bean flew. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a visitor from Kentucky. Would you please welcome Ron Whitehead, please. Thank you. Tapping my own phone. I'm going straight. Bought myself a flat top haircut so stiff I can carry a tray of martinis waiting on people. Someone to open up her purse and give me a tip cause I don't have a clue anymore as to what's going on. But I do know that I'm one step ahead tapping my own phone to hear myself talking with people who used to be my friends. Listening so I can correct myself before they do. And I've got a surveillance camera in my abandoned car across the street watching myself replaying the tape so I can see if I'm acting funny before they catch me doing something I shouldn't like yesterday. I spotted myself walking too fast and I heard myself talking too loud. Yes, I've got the deep fear, paranoia, anxiety, despair, and suicide blues. But I'm making sure I don't do nothing else wrong because I done screwed up so many times I cornered myself into a back street dead end alley of paranoia and every time I hear an airplane or helicopter or car door slam, I know the Secret Service, the FBI, and the IRS SWAT teams have finally arrived because I published a poem by the President of the United States of America without his fully conscious permission. And I'm sure I haven't paid enough taxes because I've got no income yet. Somehow I keep on doing things like eating every once in a while and paying a light bill or two, but how do I do it? They're going to ask, what's the source of your income and how come you don't come to see us anymore? So, yes, I've become a little jumpy, but I'm staying one step ahead, tapping my own phone, videotaping my every move, watching myself day and night, replaying the tapes because I've got a bad, bad, bad case of the deep fear, paranoia, anxiety, despair, and suicide blues. Now on Wednesday nights the poets all gather to recite. And Barney Sheehan is the man who runs the open mic. Now it's world famous for his poetry delights. Gleason's White House Bar Gleason's White House Bar A Gleason's White House Bar You always find a welcome here So stop and have a jar A Gleason's White House Bar A Gleason's White House Bar Or sing a song or read a poem Or strum an old guitar A Gleason's White House Bar Ladies and gentlemen, our next poet, give a very warm welcome, please, to a poet that's once again been with us for a long, long time. Good to have them that way. Gerard Nix. Thank you very much, Gerard. Thank you. Thank you, Barney. Now, the first poem tonight is called uh, Nature Suffering. Black snow for the mountain, acid rain for the trees, filthy slush for the flowers, greasy sleet for the fields. Dioxins for the cows, genetic modification for the bees, radiation for the fish, a la carte for the fleas. The world is in a hothouse, the land is in a squeeze, the river banks are in a pressure, the poles are sinking in the seas. The monster is in our minds, the power is in our limbs. The strength is in our stomachs. Must the unborn suffer for our sins? And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd ask you to give a very warm welcome to another one of our own poets here, but he's come all the way up from Dingle tonight, Louis Mulcahy. Thank you very much, Louis. Forced Enlightenment. I was making a fruit salad as news was coming through. 
Bush was sending more troops to waste Iraqi lives. What could I do in protest? Very little. But cut the grapes and think of his, and slice bananas too, and squash the grapefruit into orange, tear the peaches into bits, and over all spread strawberries that spilled all through that bruised melange, red juice that looked like blood. I would ask Marcel Croner to join us, please, at the microphone. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Today I had a nice conversation about, uh, about nativity. And at this moment I, I thought uh, women were punished in the Old Testament by God to giving birth. And what nice guy he is in the New Testament to create birth as a big celebration. So... Uh, I thought it is a good opportunity to read Celebrating You. Celebrating You, dedicated to Rachel. Celebrating You, where we lying at the bank and on its edge willows, we're watering for a last time before taking to the road, drifting like sails in the wind. But we stayed as and where we were, fast asleep with his shining eyes, and as the sea was lured, Above us a silver arc arose. Thus, it seems this was the fruit, father it at the spring and with the seas familiar, and immersed deeply in ourselves and moistened us within the blessed source. Lost child, have you preserved us from sobriety when we are drunk with desire? and days from embraces clouded with roses, and also within the desire to baptize you. There we are, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much indeed, and thank all the mic points. Ladies and gentlemen, please, give him a very warm welcome. I need to say no more. Knut Skinner, please, you're very, very welcome. Please, a boot of us. The window seat. I found Edna stretched out there, absorbing the sun. You look just like a cat, I announced, and put down my armload of books. Do you also purr? I purr when I feel like purring, she said. And then she produced a deliberate, slow, mouth-open yawn. That's how we yawn, she told me after turning her face to the window. Fetch me some mice, she added, and maybe I'll purr. Will you purr if I pet you, I asked leaning over the window seat and touching her hair. Cats have to be in the mood. Now go back to shelving your books while I scratch my fleas. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. Give a very warm welcome, please, to Patricia Barr. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, a few weeks ago we had a poet here called John Minahan, and John talk about, talked about f uh, found poetry or thrash, thrash can poetry, um, where you basically take words from any source, really, ads or newspapers or things people are saying. So I decided I'd try to write some of these. So I have a few found, found poems. And the first one is uh, about, I went to a chiropodist in a small town in the west of Ireland about a year ago, and she had uh, a lot of children, this chiropodist, uh, that she talked about. And when I got home, I wrote, I wrote down as much as I could remember about what she said of them. So it's called The Chiropodus Half Dozen. You know, don't you, that I have six of them. Did I tell you I was in Portugal with the six of them? Threw everything in the suitcase and did the ironing over there. You really do need a break with six of them. Four boys and two girls. Feeding them is the worst of all. I boil a dozen eggs every morning, let them eat them for breakfast and throw the rest into sandwiches for their lunches for the six of them. Keeps the hunger at bay, I say. They love Christmas cake, all six of them. So I make it all year round. Today I've pounds of fruit steeping. Who cares? As for himself, he's okay. He'd sweep the floor all day, but never think of washing it. That sort, you know yourself. But we wouldn't be without them. We love them to death, all six of them. That's my shot. Our next part, ladies and gentlemen, give a very warm welcome. He's here with us. I know he's here, John Carmen, you are here. Hello. Uh, this one's called the, the Year of the Eye in Here, Noddy Adelaide in Dublin. 
I wanted to clasp her hand, a silent message of gratitude. The guns were out, cold stairs in, abundant round of attitude. She ignored them, smiled at me, stood close, stroked my hair. Her soft Dublin accent whispered softly to my ear. A warm hand brushed my neck. I no longer saw a nurse. Five years away from such a touch, imagination had me immersed. The cuffs appeared. I was taken, never to know her name. Back to my world of solitude, never quite the same. <laughs> Our next guest, ladies and gentlemen, would you give a very warm welcome, please, to Michael O'Connell. Thank you very much, Michael. This poem is called The Outsider. In life, he was tossed about by wild emotion, rudderless on life's vast ocean, sheltering in public places, birthing in strangers' faces, for there were no ports at home. In death... Is he, now at peace, at last at rest, painless, free of others' jest, or still frenetic, rushes about, hears the demons yell and shout, in the twisted corridors of mind, does death too prove unkind? For him is there no comfort still, has death not ceased? his life's deep chill. Thank you. Will you please, Dominic, ladies and gentlemen, please, give a very, very warm welcome to, to Mark Whelan, ladies and gentlemen. I forgot to... Very, very short poem. It's a, a Zen... A, a, no, 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 no. Zen poem. Zen scarecrow. Two paths, oneself. There's the mountain. There's the sea. Thank you. Famous people have set foot inside this bar. Harrison O'Grady and Graves who travelled far. Jim Timmy and Frank McCourt, they often shared a jar. At Gleason's White House Bar. Oh, Gleason's White House Bar. At Gleason's White House Bar. You'll always find a welcome here, so stop and have a jar. At Gleason's White House Bar. White House bar, I'll sing a song or read a poem or strum an old guitar at Gleason's White House bar. Our next poet, ladies and gentlemen, give a very warm welcome, please, to Marion O'Rourke. Thank you very much, Marion. Thank you. Um, I wrote this poem um, when I was living in the mountains in New Mexico, and it was a time when I thought I'd never write another poem. So I said to myself, OK, why don't you just go for a walk and see if you could find a poem? So this was the result. In search of a poem. I climb alone this mountain road, white as an empty page that turns by pine and ponderosa. Should I bring home the morning dove Arrange her feathers in a verse. Five brown cows who kick up dust, or flies who circle balls of dung. Do I make rhyme for them? Is this how poems are made, or are they something, something far more deeply felt? A secret fever in the heart that words alone can soothe. Um, I should have mentioned that that line, something far more deeply felt, I think it's a line from one of Wordsworth's poems. I can't remember which one, but it just came, that line came to me. And the next day I went back out again, and um, I picked up this little poem on the walk. It's called My Field. Uh, beside the water tower at Torreon, the field I love so much waits for me each year. Here bales of hay curl like contented snails along the grass. Rimmed by sunflowers, a three-cornered hat where two roads meet. Thank you. For your pleasure and ours. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Kevin Higgins, please. Kevin, take over the evening. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Barney. And uh, thanks to both uh, uh, Barney and Dominic and everyone involved in organising these readings. I've, I've, I think it's a brilliant scene that uh, Barney and Dominic have cultivated, and it takes work. I know that to keep it going. Especially, I don't know how you do it every week. I think in Galway they need, need a break, usually kind of t once every two weeks or once a month, but it's uh, great to be here. I'll start off with a kind of a serious poem. It's uh, called To Hell and Back Again, and it's kind of, kind of about you spend years trying to find yourself, and then you do, and you think, oh my God. But anyway, To Hell and Back Again. Now that at last you seem to have found yourself, you often long to be lost again, to drift down a throbbing street in the thick of the afternoon at the centre of your own solar system, to shilly-shally for hours over a mug of tea and a slice of toast in some greasy spoon where no one would even dream of asking for a cappuccino or a latte, or better still, not to bother leaving your filthy flat all day at all, but when the last ray of sun has finally gone away, to shamble down to the kebab house for a pickled onion and a portion of chips because you don't have the cash to use the brothel around the back. But if you slip from these shackles, your future, which opens up like a new continent that of course must be conquered, this clean living which sometimes fits you like a collar and tie on a boiling hot day at one of those awkward family occasions. If you go back to all that liberty, to all that hell, you might not make it back again this time. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite Polly Fitzpatrick, please, to join us for the first time this year. Polly has been with us for the past nine months and engages in poetry on Limerick Radio and has been a great friend of ours here. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a big clap for Polly Fitzpatrick. Thank you very much indeed. Hello, everybody. Space race. Russia started off the race. They sent up Sputnik 1. This did amaze the world. I believe it weighed a ton. The youngster did not like this, so they joined in the fray. They started launching rockets, and they're well away today. They sent up their own satellites high up in the sky. Everyone could see them, even with the naked eye. Then they told the world that the day was coming soon when the USA would land a man upon the moon. Of course they did achieve this. They really are the, the stars. Look what they have done now. Put a camera up on Mars. Whatever way you look at it, it surely makes you wonder. Will they ever stop at all from sending space probes yonder? Does it benefit the human race? Or is it just cardiology? Is it just a waste of time and modern technology? I'm sure that it would make some sense if this action they would cease and use this money and their brains and succeed to cure disease. A camera on the planet Mars just lose us to our seats. Look how long it took us to get some on our streets. Oh, he's there, he's with the Ladies and gentlemen, please, thank you very much. Edward O'Dwyer. This isn't a very, very serious poem. It's called Encounters with Death. Regularly now, I'm bumping into death on the dark, lonely street corners of the nighttime city. Perhaps to look less conspicuous in this, the 21st century, he's cut short his cloak to waist length, wears black tracksuit bottoms and Nike trainers with it. But the glow of that white face, stark inside its black veil, is unmistakably his. He flashes just enough of his gleaming blade from a slack sleeve to let me know he's the real thing. But will he says, just like the last time we met, pardon me for only a cigarette. His bony fingers outstretching towards me. I reach to my pocket for the little carton, hold it out, allowing him to, dra allowing him to draw it himself. Light it with care, not to look at his face with more than a glance. 
walking away from another encounter with death, I wonder how much longer this dirty habit can keep me alive. I'd ask you to give a very sincere, warm welcome to young men, Ronan Devey. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Bernie. You know, of course, the act of trying to count sheep to try to get to sleep. And uh, anyone who knows me pretty well knows that I suffer quite well from insomnia. So I decided to write this one night. Bedtime sheep. Every time I try to count to sheep, I get to about three and then the fun starts to happen. Each of them have personalities and style and jewellery and clothes and then they stop jumping over the fence and start dancing near the fence because they got bored. So then they have the daytime sheep dance festival. There's a group over there right now having a competition to see who can eat the most grass without puking. Dave is winning. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Cunningham. Thank you very much indeed. Stones. We played on the treaty stone steep steps, slippery with history and rain. We knew the tales of Ginkle and of Sarsfield, of heroic defence and sails too late appearing up the Shannon. But all we wanted was to climb, to be king of the King John's Castle, little Arthur's tugging at Excalibur's. Fingers learning the braille of stone was incidental, a bonus for exile, when gulls, not wild geese, spread wings on Dunleary and Ross Lair tides. Touching the Hepworths in St. Ives, or the monolithic moors beside the Thames, is recognition, a triggering of instinct. And the name is right, moor, translated big or huge, like the treaty stone like a child's imagination. Her name is Rosemary, and she's Rosemary O'Shea, ladies and gentlemen. Please, our next poet. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, this one is called Johnny Forticoats. He walked into our yard, the tallest man I'd ever seen. His sad, dark eyes looked out from a pale and weathered face. He scared me. His shoulders stooped, his long black coat, and underneath at least three more, and all his clothes had holes. He wore big battered boots with flapping soles exposing filthy feet. I'm fearful for my mother. How will she send this filthy wretch away? But then, to my dismay, he's welcomed, treated as an honoured guest. I can't believe she's really pleased to see him. Cooking food for him sends me back out to play. When later on I saw her walk into the gate, I asked her, why are you so nice to him? He's dirty and he's smelly. Turning round, she eyed me with a look of sadness. Don't ever talk like that, she said. She softly said. What you don't know is, long ago, when kings ruled here, he would have been a welcomed, he would have been a welcomed guest in the king's palace. For Johnny is a bard. He walks the length and breadth of Ireland and it's a great honour when he calls and eats the food that I've prepared. For I am in the place of kings when Johnny tells of places far from Cork and I can feel I travel there when Johnny calls. Next time Johnny called, I told my brother about him being a bard and in the king's palace. He only laughed. But I saw Johnny in a whole new light. I learned that there were other ways of seeing. Thank you. I've also got Tim Evans here, the Shanakee. Would you like to just hear one story from Tim before we go into the guest boys? My father never took off his hat except when he was going into bed or into mass. And my mother said he slept in the two places. At that time, every man covered his head. There was respect for the brain, then a delicate instrument, as well as covering your head. A hat is a handy receptacle. If you're caught chopped, you could give a fish to votes to a horse out of a hat. You could bring in new laid eggs from the hen house. You could take down apples from the orchard. You could even put a hen hatching in your hat. 
a small hin, a guinea hin or a bantam. Head gear gives a man authority. The popes and the kings and the bishops know this. They always cover their heads when they have something important to say. Sure, where would a storyteller be without his hat? As he stands inside in Barney Sheen's Poetry Revival Symposium to tell a story. Shai That's a bit of Barney's Blarney. Shai Ladies and gentlemen, give him a very fine boot of us, please. That's Not some challenge for you, I can tell you. I don't know what to say. I know this much. It's engaging, isn't it? Lovely to hear humour and poetry and verse. And we get on with the Barney. Shut up, you're getting in trouble. What, what is it again, please? Can I just repeat it to make it easy for everybody? And now we come, ladies and gentlemen, to the last point of the evening. And I'd ask you to give a young man. He's an extraordinary character. I've been across from what you're going to get now for the finish for the night. For the night for the night. I don't know what it will be. Extraordinary words, extraordinary strength. It's a great poetry. Thank you um, very much indeed, Don Loughlin. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, please. Once again, we go across the world. That's it. Our next poet, ladies and gentlemen, we go from the men back to the girls. I don't know. I haven't got as many in life as he's got, but I still can speak the Irish. Got to be the mark with the Vishingo Hunter Ganesha. And my guys, this is Nick Good. I think that was so good. Is that correct, please? In French, we tell the army. Bless you, but shut up, Barney. For Christ's sake, get on with the poetry. Come all you lads and lassies now, come all you from afar. This is the story of a pub called Gleason's White House Bar. Down by the lordly Shannon is Limerick's brightest star. Gleason's White House Bar. The Gleason's White House Bar. The Gleason's White House Bar. You'll always find the welcome here, so stop and have a jar. At Gleason's White House Bar. Gleason's White House Bar. Sing a song or read a poem or strum an old guitar at Gleason's White House Bar. Bought by Caffrey Moses as a grocery wine store, and then the sea words white and haze made it so much more. It was taken by the Gleason family before the war. Gleason's White House Bar. A Gleason's White House Bar, a Gleason's White House Bar. You'll always find a welcome here, so stop and have a jar. A Gleason's White House Bar, a Gleason's White House Bar. Or sing a song, or read a poem, or strum an old guitar. A Gleason's White House Bar. Tuesday nights if you want to hear a different tune There's Chris and Tom and Joe and Dom all howling at the moon The guitars ring, the singers sing and the bar on just goes boom At Gleason's White House Bar At Gleason's White House Bar At Gleason's White House Bar You'll always find a welcome here so stop and have a jar at Gleason's White House Bar, at Gleason's White House Bar, or sing a song, or read a poem, or strum an old guitar. At Gleason's White House Bar. Now on Wednesday nights the poets all gather to recite, and Barney Sheehan is the man who runs the open mic. Now it's world famous for its poetry delights. Gleason's White House Bar. Gleason's White House Bar. A Gleason's White House Bar. You always find a welcome here, so stop and have a jar. A Gleason's White House Bar. A Gleason's White House Bar. A sing a song or read a poem or strum an old guitar. A Gleason's White House Bar. Famous people have set foot inside this bar. Harris and O'Grady and Graves who travel far. Jim Timmy and Frank McCourt, they often share the jar. At Gleason's White House Bar. Oh, Gleason's White House Bar. A Gleason's White House Bar. You'll always find a welcome here, so stop and have a jar. At Gleason's White House Bar. Gleason's White House Bar I'll sing a song or read a poem Or strum an old guitar At Gleason's White House Bar